Welcome and thank you for standing by. Currently all participants in our listen-only mode. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted publicly. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I'd like to turn the call over to Mary McKay. Mary, you may begin. Thanks, Lisa, and hello, everyone. My name is Mary McKay, and I work in the American Community Survey Office at the U.S. Census Bureau. I'm here with my colleague, Michael Burroughs, to share more information about commuting data and the American Community Survey. Before we begin, I want to share a little housekeeping. So today's webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be posted after the webinar. In addition, the PDF versions of the slides are available on the ACS events page at the link shown on the slide. If you need closed captioning, please click on the CC icon on your screen to access them. And finally, please submit your questions in the Q&A window of the WebEx and our colleagues will do their best to respond. Thank you so much for tuning in today and hopefully we can entertain you and deepen your understanding about the commuting data available through the American Community Survey. Let's briefly go over today's agenda. The first part of today's webinar, I'll be going over the basics of the American Community Survey, including the history of the survey and the geographies covered. Next, Michael and I will share data tables, tools, and products available to you regarding commuting data. This includes a few live demonstrations to show you where these data and tools are. And finally, we're gonna share resources you can access to learn more. So the ACS is the nation's most current, reliable, and accessible data source for local statistics on critical planning topics, such as commuting. The survey randomly samples approximately 3.5 million addresses each year. These data are collected continuously throughout the year to produce annual social, economic, housing, and demographic estimates. The Census Bureau typically releases three different sets of data estimates from the ACS each year, in the form of one-year estimates for geographies of 65,000 or more, one-year supplemental estimates for geographies of 20,000 or more, and five-year period data sets for all geographies down to the census tract and block route for some tables. The ACS was fully implemented in 2005 and began collecting data for all America's communities each year. There is also the Puerto Rico Community Survey, PRCS, which is the equivalent of the ACS in Puerto Rico. In 2010 and moving forward, the decennial census is only a short form sent to all households because the American Community Survey now collects information each year that was once collected by the long form on the decennial census each decade. And one final thing I want to mention is that the first ACS one-year estimates are from 2005, and the first five-year ACS release was the 2005 to 2009 data set. Along with the numerous topics covered, the ACS also provides data for more geographies on an annual basis than any other household survey. The image on this slide shows some of the geographies for which ACS data are produced and the relationship between them. Lower geographic areas fit neatly within the larger areas directly connected with lines. For example, school, congressional, and state legislative districts fit neatly within states and do not cross state boundaries. However, they may cross boundaries of counties or metropolitan areas. In this visualization, you can also see that the smallest group, the smallest geographic building block for the ACS is the block group. The ACS's unique ability to report on a wide range of geographies is what gives it such a broad appeal. And we will see in our live demonstration on data.census.gov how to get diverse commuting data at some of these smaller geographies. As I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, the ACS provides estimates, and that in and of itself is a strength of the ACS, estimating characteristic distribution. The Census Bureau recommends that users compare population characteristics such as percents, means, medians, and rates rather than estimates of population totals. Now, if you're looking for population totals, we recommend using the Decennial Census or Population Estimates Program. In general, the Census Bureau recommends that you do compare estimates from non-overlapping periods. For example, compare a 2013 to 2017 ACS five-year estimate to a 2018-2022 ACS five-year estimate. Do not compare overlapping periods. So do not compare a 2017 to 2021 ACS five-year estimate to a 2018-2022 ACS five-year estimate. Do compare similar period lengths. So do compare one-year estimates to one-year estimates or five-year to five-year, but do not compare estimates from different period lengths. So don't compare a one-year to a five-year. 
The comparison guidance page provides broad information about comparing ACS estimates across years and with the 2010 and 2020 census. So I'm going to hop over to my browser and show you where to find this page. We're going to go to census.gov forward slash ACS to get to the ACS homepage. Then we're going to click on guidance for data users and this first top option comparing ACS data. So we release comparison guidance for every one year and five year data release, and we're going to click on the most recent 2022 comparison guidance. For example, you might be interested in commuting, which is why you're here. So we want to see what we can do with comparing estimates. So we're here at the 2022 ACS one year estimates. We're going to click here to expand the list. Before we continue, I'm going to point you to the 08 that's in parentheses here. So 08 is the subject code for all things commuting. And this is going to come up in our live demonstration, but you'll also see that we have these subject codes for the other topics in the ACS as well. But going back to the comparison guidance, we can see that there's all these topics within the subject of commuting and how the Census Bureau recommends that you can compare them. We can also scroll down and see the five-year comparison guidance for the same thing here with commuting. And you'll see that there's a little note here to consider when you're going to compare the 2018-2022 ACS five-year to the 2013-2017 ACS five-year. I want to bring up an important component of ACS estimates now, the margins of error or MOEs. MOEs allow data users to be certain that at a given level of confidence, the estimate and the actual population value differ by no more than the value of the MOE. The Census Bureau uses a 90% confidence level as its standard. All ACS estimates published on data.census.gov have margins of error calculated at that 90% confidence level, and you'll see this in the demonstration. It's also important to note that the MOEs provided by the Census Bureau are always in the same units as their respective estimate. So for example, a percent estimate is going to have a percent margin of error, and a commuting time in minutes is going to have a margin of error in minutes. So put simply, the margin of error is a measure of the possible variation of an estimate around the population value. So here we have detail table B08006, sex of workers by means of transportation, as it is displayed on data.census.gov for the state of Alaska. The table has three elements here, the characteristics, AKA the description, so total car, truck, or van, or drove alone, the estimates, and then their corresponding margins of error. So in this example, we wanna know how many individuals drive alone to work in Alaska, which I've outlined here in red. We find the lower bound by subtracting the margin of error from the estimate. And similarly, we find the upper bound by adding the estimate and the margin of error. So we are 90% confident that the true number of people in Alaska who drive alone falls between the lower bound of 224,621 and the upper bound of 237,411. So now that we have the basics of the ACS covered, let's hop into the commuting data. Thanks, Mary. Um, so yeah, commuting questions first showed up on census surveys all the way back in 1960. Um, and that was part of the decennial census long form, which meant that just a sample of the population were asked one or more questions related to commuting. Um, but back in 1960, the question was limited to the means of transportation to work. Um, but besides changes to a couple of categories, that question has actually remained largely the same since that time. Although it is worth noting that in 1960, uh, it was assumed that whoever was going to work was a he. So that's one aspect of the question that has changed over that time period. Um, by 2000, the questions that had expanded to be more or less the same as what we see today on the ACS, uh, which is to say after 2000, this question disappeared from the decennial census and it's only on the American Community Survey. <clears throat> so first we collect information about means of transportation to work. Um, we ask the person to select from a list of common methods the way that they usually travel the most of the distance to work. Um, we also ask a supplemental question pictured on the right about the number of riders um, if they ride by car, truck, or van, which allows us to classify uh, workers who carpool to work. The universe for this question includes all workers age 16 and older, so we're able to account for how uh, all workers get to work or whether they work from home with this question. This is probably the question from our content area that is of the most interest to outside researchers and policymakers. 
Uh, most recently, with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the sharp increase in working from home has generated a lot of interest. Next year, we'll be updating the taxi cab line in this question uh, to taxi and ride hailing services. And this is an effort to ensure that some newer but still sort of familiar modes of commuting are being captured consistently. And next, uh, we, we ask uh, those who travel to work uh, for the time of day that they usually depart from their home for work. This is the time of departure for work. Um, we limit this universe to commuters. That is, we're not asking people who report working from home. Um, and this is a question that's of interest to groups like transportation planners uh, who tend to use these data to estimate how demand for transportation services fluctuate throughout the day. Uh, next, we ask all commuters uh, their travel time to work. And this is a question we just ask the number of minutes uh, they travel to work, uh, their typical one-way travel time to work. Again, this universe is limited to commuters. We're excluding home-based workers here. And we find this to be a pretty helpful broad measure of how commuting burden has changed over time. Um, in some recent data products, we've emphasized, too, how travel time varies by geography, uh, for example, in dense metropolitan areas compared to sparser communities outside major metros. Uh, we also usually observe very interesting variation, and we've reported on some interesting variation by commuting mode uh, differences among, for example, those who bike to work and those who take public transportation. Um, and the last piece of information that we collect about commuting is the place of work. Um, we collect place of work information for every worker, including those who work from home, um, so that we can basically reconstruct commutes for everyone in the survey. Um, we ask people for address level information on the location where the person worked uh, during the reference period. Um, and this information allows us to have an origin and destination relationship for every working respondent in the survey. Uh, these relationships we refer to as commuting flows. And I'll talk about this a little bit more later on in the presentation. So with the foundation of the community commuting data established, let's head on to data.census.gov to get an idea of what is available to you, the data user. So data.census.gov is the Census Bureau's main data dissemination platform, and it's the primary way to access data from the American Community Survey, 2020 Census, and more. Data.census.gov allows users to filter searches through topics or geographies, download data files, and create customized maps. And it includes ACS data from 2010 to present. And it's that one year, one year supplemental, and five year estimates that you're gonna find here on data.census.gov. The team in charge of data.census.gov constantly releases new resources, trainings, and presentations to help maximize your experience. So as a data user myself, I'm always learning more from their resources. So do yourself a favor and check them out. And to learn more, please visit the links at the bottom of the slide. So let's hop back over to my browser and we're gonna go to data.census.gov. This is the homepage. Before I begin, I just wanna remind you that there are many routes that you can take to get to your end destination. What I'm doing today is not necessarily the only way or the only step in order to get there. Um, this is just one way or two ways that I do it. So I'm gonna show two different ways to find commuting data through data.census.gov. The first one is using this advanced search feature. So I like to use the advanced search feature if I'm generally interested in knowing what is out there when it comes in terms of commuting. So what tables are there? I wanna explore as many options as I can. And with this, I'm able to apply filters. So I'm just gonna click right into advanced search. The filters are gonna show up on the left side. We have geography and topics. So for this, I'm gonna click on employment and I'm gonna see that commuting is right here. The nice thing about this is you can jump around to different filters if you don't know that commuting is under employment. Maybe you thought it was under business and economy. You can still click through and see it, it doesn't do any damage. You can also apply multiple filters. So if you're interested in commuting and then age and sex, you can apply these filters. It's just gonna limit what shows up on your search results. But for this, I'm only interested in commuting in general. So I wanna see everything there is. So I selected my filter and I'm gonna click search here. And then I'm gonna come on to the top and click on tables. And luckily for me, this first table that shows up is exactly what I want because it has this carpool variable. That's what I'm interested in today. Tomorrow, I might be interested in another commuting variable, but today I want carpooled. So S0801 is the table for me. It's commuting characteristics by sex. I see the default geography is the United States. We have two, we have a column set for total. We have the estimate, the corresponding margin of error, and then it breaks it down by sex, male, female. I'm gonna click on the title 
to see that right now it's set at the ACS one year estimate. So this is the most recent one year data available. And just a reminder, ACS one year estimates are only for populations with 65,000 or more. And as I'm brainstorming what I wanna do today, I realize that I'm going to need a data set that can give me more geographies. I'm actually interested in census tracts. So I'm gonna use this ACS five year estimate. And this 2022 ACS five year was just released last week. So it is our most recent data release. So I've selected the five year, then I'm gonna go back into this filters here to click on census tract. Now just give it a second. Sometimes it'll show you a little stall a little bit, but that's okay. We're gonna click into Delaware. Census tracts are organized by county. I'm gonna click on Kent County and I'm interested in just a couple census tracts here. I'm gonna select here and here. Nice feature is you can collect all census tracts of a county if you're interested. I'm gonna X out and minimize here to see my window. So I see one census tract I selected and then the second one with the corresponding estimates. And I can look here and see that 5.5% of workers 16 years and over carpool to work in this census tract in Kent County. And here's that corresponding margin of error. From here, you can click Excel CSV or ZIP if you wanna download these data. And I will say that Excel is going to mirror what you're seeing on your browser most closely. So that's one way is if you're just generally interested, you can use that as advanced search feature. I'm gonna go back to the main page and do searching in the window. So I've done all my browsing advanced search. So I have a handful of tables that I wanna get directly to. This is where that search is gonna come up in handy. So I'm gonna type in B. B corresponds to detail tables. Detail tables are the only tables that we release at the block group level, but not all detail tables have that level. So from here, I'm gonna remind you of that subject code 08. Here's a little trick for you while you're searching. If you're only interested in commuting variables, you can use an asterisk here and it's gonna pull up all detail tables. So all tables that start in B08 for commuting. So I can click here and see that there's 76 tables. But right now I know an exact table I want. So I'm gonna go back to that main screen and type in B08501, means of transportation to work by age for workplace geography. I'm gonna click enter and view my table. Now from here, you have the same exact features you had in advance. You can apply more filters. I'm actually, the default geography here is gonna be by state. I'm gonna click into that table and make sure this time that I have the one-year estimates because I'm interested in using one-year estimates at the state level. I'm gonna click into my geographies and limit to just three states that I'm interested in. So I'll scroll down here and I want Delaware, Maryland and Pennsylvania. So this will limit my geographies. I can X out and see that now I have for Delaware, Maryland and Pennsylvania. And again, you can click here and download whatever format that you want. But that was just a brief demonstration. These are just two ways in which you can use data.census.gov to find your estimates and tables. And I'm now gonna pass it over to Michael to talk about another commuting data set available to you, the commuting flows data set. Thank you, Mary. Um, so yeah, earlier on when I mentioned our place of work information, I also mentioned our commuting flows. Uh, and now I'd like to go into a little more detail on uh, the purpose that those serve. Um, so they're a sort of a special application of our place of work information that we gather in that commuting module, uh, which we combine with the residence information that's associated with every record in the American Community Survey. Uh, together, these two pieces of information allow us to have, uh, as I mentioned before, an origin and a destination relationship for every working respondent. Uh, these relationships we refer to as commuting flows, and they provide an important resource for many state and local planners. Um, they're also critical uh, to supporting the Office of Management of Bu and Budgets, uh, construction of the country's metropolitan uh, and micropolitan statistical areas, uh, a geographical uh, division that many people are familiar with. Um, these these, uh, these county to county commuting flows, they come out every five years. Um, and that's when they are applied to that OMB process of constructing the country's CBSAs. Uh, and, and the most recent came out just this year using the 2016 uh, to 2020 data. So that next edition uh, will be coming out in another five years uh, using non, non, the next non-overlapping five-year ACS data set. Um, so as I mentioned, we publish these flows at the level of the county. Um, that means that uh, there's a lot of potential flows. Basically every county in the United States could flow uh, into every other county 
uh, which if they did would be almost 10 million different county to county flows. Uh, but in practice, there's not a flow from every county to every other county. So we only have about 120,000 unique county to county flows. Um, it's still a lot, but it's not 10 million. And that means we can still uh, fit it into a spreadsheet, which uh, I think Mary is going to show us an example of now. Um, so we published two spreadsheets uh, with the county to county commuting flows, and they actually contain identical data, uh, but we sort them in different ways um, because our data users uh, have different uses uh, for these different data sets. Uh, so here's an example of what they look like. Table one presents flows sorted by residence geography. Uh, so that's the uh, county in which people live. Um, so in the most recent 2016 to 2025 year data for a few areas of New York, uh, we'll look at this example. In our first line, we see that the residence county is Kings County, uh, which is the same as Manhattan for New York. And the workplace county is Albany, um, which is a fair distance away in upstate New York. Uh, so when we look at that commuting flow estimate, we see unsurprisingly that not that many people report commuting from Manhattan uh, to Albany County. Um, and Mary mentioned before the margins of error associated with all ACS estimates, and that's true uh, for our commuting flows data sets as well. Uh, we see for that estimate of 411 people commuting from Kings County to Albany County, the margin of error is 155. Um, so not that many people, and on the other hand, a lot of people do report commuting from Kings County uh, to Bronx County, the next line down. Uh, that's about 12,000 people, which makes some sense uh, because it's right next door. Um, and again, at the, on the lines below that, I'd like folks to note um, that with these small estimates, we tend to have fairly large margins of error. Um, and so estimates must always be interpreted and compared with some caution. So in lines three to five here, uh, the workplace counties are uh, Broome County, Cattaraugus County, and Delaware County. We can't actually differentiate these, estimate, these estimates from one another. Because uh, when you consider the margins of error, the possible range of those estimates do overlap. Now, our second table that we publish um, are actually the same data, as I mentioned, but they're sorted by workplace county. Uh, so instead of sorting by where people live, we sort by where they work. Uh, so the difference is pretty straightforward, um, but you can see on the left-hand side that the residence counties um, are changing while the workplace county on the right is staying the same. So instead of seeing the flows of workers out from one county into a bunch of others, uh, we're kind of seeing the different counties that are feeding into a workplace county uh, during the day. Uh, still, you can sort either table any way that you'd like, but we've historically provided a shortcut for, for data users that, that prefer to have it accessible. So in the last slide, we saw that about 12,000 people commuted from Kings County or, or Manhattan to Bronx County every day. Now we can see that about twice that many commute daily from Bronx County to Kings County. Um, and once more here, we're seeing some very large margins of error on some of the smaller estimates. So many estimates on the sample screenshot are statistically indistinguishable uh, from one another. <clears throat> so our commuting flows data sets are published at the county level. Um, so that means that they can be aggregated up to the metro or the micro level or to core-based statistical areas. Uh, or anything above that, which would mean state, division, or region. Um, but we generally see them used for counties within CBSAs. As I mentioned, they come out uh, roughly every five years using non-overlapping five-year data, with the most recent coming out this year using 2016 to 2020 data. Um, the granularity of these data do tend to generate a lot of excitement within our data user community, um, especially for localities that are seeking to understand how people move around on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so we're excited to publish these products and we hope people get a lot of use out of them. So now that you have the foundations of the different community data estimates, let's go over some resources for you to learn more. So as we introduced, there are both ACS estimates about commuting data and the commuting flows data set. So it's important to highlight their differences to help fuel your decision-making about what you should use for your needs. The ACS's purpose is to release detailed population and housing information about the United States and its communities on an annual basis. New data are available every year, and you can access them on data.census.gov, like I demonstrated, but also the FTP, API, Quick Facts, and several other Census Bureau data tools.
Michael, do you want to go over the commuting flows? Yes. Um, so uh, I apologize. The the commuting flows are produced to support, as I mentioned, the Office of Management and Budgets, Metropolitan and Micropolitan Statistical Area delineations and updates. Um, so the metro and micro areas that many of us are familiar with. Um, we release them every five years using non-overlapping data sets, um, and they're available by Excel download on the link displayed in the table. And if you're still unsure what the data set is the best option for you, we set up some hypothetical scenarios to demonstrate when you would use the ACS or the commuting flows data set. So, for example, if you want to get commuting estimates of smaller geographies, such as census tracts, use the ACS like you saw in my live demonstration. So, if you wanted to know the percentage of workers living in a certain census tract in a county that have travel times to work less than 10 minutes, you can use the ACS. And for smaller counties, you want to use the ACS five-year estimates. And then likewise, if you're looking for annual data, data to compare over time, so if you want to compare one year to one year, you're going to use those ACS estimates again. And more specifically, you're going to use the ACS one-year estimates. And in case you're looking to estimate specifically the number of, number of workers traveling between counties or any geographical subdivision larger than counties, including metro areas or states, uh, during their typical commute, that's when we advise you to turn to the commuting flows. I just wanted to quickly walk through how to get to the commuting flows. So you're just going to write commuting. This is census.gov. You can type it into the main page. And this is where you can get to the commuting main web page. So this is how you can find those commuting flows. The Excel files that Michael was talking about are going to be accessible right here publications, visualizations, and working papers. Thank you. So here are a few additional resources. Sorry on the, um, if you don't mind navigating to the former slide. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, a few additional resources we'd like to point data users to to familiarize themselves uh, with our data. First, uh, one of our recent innovations is our key indicators product. Uh, that we produce to provide some little summary glimpses of how some key measures of commuting have changed over the course of the ACS. Uh, these are updated annually, uh, and we're trying to put some popular comparisons straight into data users' hands without having to dig too much um, into data.census.gov. Although it's worth keeping in mind that everything we publish in those key indicators is also available uh, publicly on data.census.gov. Next, we have uh, some new guidance on calculating some increasingly popular commuter adjusted population estimates. Um, these estimates effectively add the number of commuters traveling into an area on a typical workday, and then subtract out the number of commuters uh, that travel into a different area uh, on that same day. Uh, so these numbers have changed dramatically with the sharp increase in working from home at the start of the pandemic. Um, and so when media are discussing the idea of like hollowed out cities due to working from home, this is a helpful method of estimating how much those numbers have actually changed in the last few years. Uh, so it's been a helpful tool to evaluate some of these broader claims that we see with some regularity. Um, we have also recently put up some supplemental information on home-based workers, um, how they're counted in different surveys and some recent publications concerning trends in home-based work. Um, in general, we encourage folks to check out our main commuting page, uh, which offers this and other information about common inquiries that come up about our data. Uh, and we'd encourage you to start there uh, while exploring our topic area, or if you have any further questions to pursue. And next, we have a glimpse of a couple of recent and forthcoming publications that we've uh, worked on or are continuing um, to put into the public. Um, last year, we completed some work on uh, home based workers in the COVID 19 pandemic, where we wanted to look at how home based work has changed between 2019 and 2021 in large part. Uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, remote work policies that accompanied it. Um, so besides the broad summary statistics, we really enjoyed looking at some of the deeper questions that have emerged over the pandemic about who was transitioning into working from home. Um, and one interesting, if intuitive, finding from this report uh, was the extent to which income was associated with home-based work, uh, both before the pandemic in 2019, but especially after its onset in 2021. We're following up that paper uh, with a shorter brief. Uh, a figure from that is pasted on the right-hand side, um, which summarizes how some of these patterns, uh, such as working from home and the decline in public transportation, have returned to their 2019 levels or how much they haven't in many cases. Um, 
we also have uh, had a chance to delve into the extent to which public transportation commuting has bounced back, which has been of substantial interest to many policymakers, especially in a few large metro areas. Um, on the last slide, I also mentioned our commuter adjusted population estimates. And at the bottom of this slide is an image from a recent America Counts story uh, where we examined how these estimates changed within the five largest metro areas in the United States. Uh, notably, and as mentioned in the title, uh, we observed that the commuter, commuter adjusted population of Manhattan declined by about 800,000 people in 2021 uh, compared to 2019. So a pretty remarkable drop in the context of this dramatic increase in working from home. In general, uh, we've put out a few more America Count stories where we try to get at some of the subpopulations of particular interest uh, in, uh, in the sort of mainstream narrative or uh, smaller subgroups that we haven't had a chance to explore in some of our larger reports. And I believe those links will be provided in the, uh, in the chat window. And now shifting back to the ACS, so if you're a user and you've accessed the data, but you need more information to understand the tables and complete your analysis, we do have several resources in our technical documentation section. And I'm going to jump back onto my browser to show you how to get there. So from the ACS home webpage, you're just going to click, it's real hard. You're going to click on technical documentation on the left side. And here is where we're going to go. And I want to point out a few really great resources within this section, clicking on code list definitions and accuracy. We have this subject definitions document. So this is a really valuable tool to get more details about how and what is measured in ECS variables. So this is a great place to start and we do update this every year with every data release. So I highly recommend checking this out if you want to understand more about the variables in the ACS estimates that you see. And then scrolling down further, I want to click on this table shells and table list page. So this is a really popular resource within technical documentation. The table shells, if we scroll down, they are uh, they display the layout of tables without the estimates or margins of error filled in, and they contain the line number, description of the data, and the table ID. And then the ACS table list contains columns with the table ID, table title, table universe, one year and five year availability for all detailed tables, supplemental estimate tables, comparison profiles, data profiles, and subject tables in one spreadsheet. And these are usually available about one, available about one week before a data release for the one year and the five year. So I highly recommend checking these out just so you know what the tables are going to have um, when they're published. And then if you're new to the ACS or you want more in-depth information on ACS resources, we do have an introductory webinar on the ACS with slides and a recording available. And we also have several modules posted in a recently launched course titled Discovering the American Community Survey. So this comprehensive guide is designed for all types of data users and those who need to understand and access the fundamentals of the ACS in order to use our data. And as we begin to wrap up today's webinar, we'd like you to stay in touch with us. So one way is telling us by how you're using American Community Survey data. Have you or your organization used the ACS to make an important decision, help your community, or expand your business? If so, please share your story to let us know and to explore how other data enthusiasts across the country are using ACS data in creative ways. Doing so provides further support for the importance of the data we collect here at the Census Bureau. Also, consider joining a group we have specifically for users of the ACS data, simply known as the ACS Data Users Group. And this group includes a website and online community with over 4,000 members, where you can share messages, materials, and announcements related to the survey. Membership is free and open to all interested ACS data users of all levels. And finally, you can sign up for and manage email updates from the ACS. Our monthly events and updates email will alert you when new materials are available and you'll stay updated on our data releases. You can visit the QR codes under each icon to learn more about these resources. And in closing, I want to share more information on, on how to find answers and get support after this webinar. So again, you can start by visiting census.gov forward slash ACS and it has a wealth of information about the survey, data products, data tools, and other helpful information. And if you still have data user questions, you can reach us by phone or email at acso.users.support at census.gov or call the number you see here. And if you have specific commuting data questions, you can reach out to Michael and his team at the emails listed. 
Census Academy is our learning hub for data skills. You can learn how to access and use Census Bureau data your way through our how to data gem videos and in depth courses, webinars, and tutorials. And this page also has a link where you can request a training at no cost from our data dissemination specialist who are located within your region and they can provide you with assistance about Census Bureau data, such as how to obtain or understand ACS estimates. If you're on social media, please connect with us at US Census Bureau. And one last thing, if you're using ACS estimates, make sure you source the Census Bureau American Community Survey to where you receive the data. It helps people know that the information they're used, using is powered by the ACS. And this concludes today's webinar on commuting data and the American Community Survey. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you learned a lot, and good luck as you start or continue your journey with the ACS. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.